That was the 17 liter engine that I built in my last engine build video firing up in that new glider. Right now I'm getting ready to start in building another one of these caterpillars. I just can't seem to get away from them no matter how hard I try. So I've got my block here ready to go. As usual did all six uppers, all six lowers, uh, and all the water holes. Not exactly sure where I'm going with this video just yet. But uh, I'm going to show you something. Got all the main caps off, so the next thing that needs to happen is the main bearings need to go in. Using more IPD parts on this one, uh, there's all my main bearings right there. They've got these new water pumps coming out, now that's a 3500 series water pump there, but they're coming out with a water pump for the A-certs, uh, A-cert C15s, and I'm pretty sure they're coming out with a pump for the pre acer C15s and 34060 s too. Here's one set of main bearings. I'll get these opened up and show you how they go in. Got all the upper main bearings in. There's nothing to it. They just slip right in. There's a tang on this side and then there's not one on this side. So the next thing to do is unwrap the crank, get it cleaned up and drop it in. Okay, I'm going to start putting main caps on, and when I get down to the end, I'll show you how to plastic gauge for oil clearance. Down to my last main cap, so I'll show you how to plastic gauge. This is red plastic gauge, so it's good for one to seven thousandths. Got my bearing in my main cap. So you just cut off a little strip of that uh, plastic gauge there and you lay it on the crank journal like so. And then you stick your main cap on. So you put your main cap on with the plastic gauge on the crank journal. You torque it to spec and then you pull the main cap right back off. Then you take your little gauge deal they give you here. And you lay it up here and compare it to the strip that's on the crank journal. And you see where it lines up with best. You're matching the width of the plastic gauge to the width on the piece of paper here. 
So this one's lining up with five thousandths. That means I got five thousandths of oil clearance on that journal. On these engines, the low side of the spec, I'm pretty sure is 36 ten thousandths. Don't quote me on that, but I know I'm allowed to have as much as 73 ten thousandths on the high side. So at five thousandths, I'm good there. Okay, all the main caps are on. They're all torqued to the initial torque, which is 200 foot-pounds. Well, it's 190 plus or minus 10. I just go to 200. I've got spinach. That's a good thing. So these main bolts still have to go another 120 degrees. Most guys will just grab an impact and run them down. That's what I'd do too if I had any sense, but I like to do them by hand. I like to feel each bolt tighten up. So this is the part where I grab this piece of pipe and this breaker bar and drag this block and crank all over this piece of plywood. I had some retard in the comments on the last video when I was doing that told me that my torque wrench was bent because I didn't know how to use it. Buddy, I hate to break it to you, but that ain't no torque wrench. It's a piece of pipe. All the mains are final torque now, so I'm done with the crankshaft installation. Uh, one more thing about that plastic gauge deal that I didn't tell you, and if I don't say it, somebody's going to comment about it. So, you plastic gauge all seven main journals and all six rod journals. You don't just do one. Each one's going to be a little bit different. So, I was just showing you how it works. That's why I only showed you one. Um, but now, it's time to flip this over, and I'll start putting liners in and checking liner protrusion. So what I'll do is install the liners in the block without the O-rings first, and that allows you to move them around and get your protrusion where you want it. Uh, these are IPD's crevice seal liner, so they've got a thicker upper O-ring groove, and it's actually tapered. It takes this big square O-ring right here, and uh, what that does is it kind of has a wedging action in the lower bore of the block, and you just get a, more of a firm fit into the bottom bore of the block. And then there's the two lower O-rings. Uh, they're just regular cat style uh, lower O-rings. And then that's the filler band. So what I'll do next is take a set of digital calipers and I'll measure around the flange on each of these liners in four spots. That just lets me know which liners may be a little bit thicker and which ones are a little thinner. They won't vary by more than about five ten thousandths to one thousandth at most. Uh, the spec says they can only vary by eight ten thousandths. So they'll all be pretty close, but just that little bit can help when you're setting up and uh, trying to get liner protrusion as optimal as it can be. All six of these liners are right at 350 thousandths. Uh, I had like two measurements out of the 24. Like I said, four places on the six liners. Like two measurements at 3,505 ten thousandths, and then all the other 22 measurements were right at 350 thousandths. So I'd call that pretty good quality control. Uh, I've got a new IPD spacer plate here, and then there's the gasket that goes underneath it. Uh, that's the rest of the gasket set, or one of them. So what I'll do now, I'll stick these liners in the block, and then put the gasket under the spacer plate and the spacer plate on the block and then start measuring protrusion. Since these liners are all so close together, it's, I pretty much know that it's going to do me no good to move liners around or rotate them or anything um, as far as trying to change protrusion when I get there because 
they're all so even that it's not going to change anything. I just finished checking liner protrusion. I decided not to bore you with all that. I'm pretty sure I've been over protrusion before in another video anyway, so if you want to see how that works and how that's done, you can go look around. Uh, it's some of my other stuff, and you'll find it in there eventually. I don't remember exactly where it's at, but anyway, um, what I will show you is how to check crankshaft in play real quick. So, got my dial indicator set up on the crank here. I'm not sure that you can see that, but I think you probably can. That dial indicator is zeroed. The crank is slipped all the way forward, so you just stick a bar up there behind the gear between the crank gear and the block, slip the crank all the way forward. And then what I'll do is take the bar and then I'll slip it back the other way. And that's going to tell you your in play. So it went from zero to uh, Right at eight thousandths. And you want to check it a couple times to make sure that your dial indicator is not moving on you. So I'll move it back and it should go back to zero. If it doesn't zero, then your dial indicator is moving on you. And it did, so. Right back to eight thousandths. So that's good, that's well within spec. When I talk about something being in spec, I'm always talking about new spec. I'm not talking about max permissible. So like with crankshaft in play, for example, I've got eight thousandths on this engine. Um, to be within new spec, I can have as much as 22 thousandths. And then max permissible with used bearings is 35 thousandths. Uh, here's what I had for liner protrusion on this one. It's pretty much 5 thousandths all the way across the board. Uh, 21 out of the 24 measurements are at 5 thousandths, and then it looks like there's three measurements at 4.5 thousandths. So everything's within a half a thousandth. That's really good. Uh, there's a whole lot that can be said about block machine work, block deck flatness, uh, upper bore and lower bore alignment. Spacer plate flatness and uniformity, cylinder head flatness, and then how the combination of those things working together uh, make the engine hold a head gasket. Um, I could probably stand here and talk about that for 20 minutes. I'm not going to because nobody wants to listen to it, but okay, liner installation. Got the lower O-rings on. Like I said before, these are uh, IPDs crevice seal liner so they've got the big thick upper band and then two regular cat style o-ring uh, o-rings below that so what I use on my lower o-rings is this Napa seal glide it's a silicone lubricant you're not supposed to use engine oil on these lower o-rings because it'll swell them up and you may have problems getting it in the lower bore of the block so you goop that stuff on those lower o-rings and then I also take it and lube up the lower in the block. You just can't have too much lube here. And then I take clean engine oil and uh, wet this upper bore down where the filler band is going to seat up against. So this is the filler band. So what you do, you take this filler band and you put it in clean engine oil and then you immediately put it on the liner and immediately put the liner in the block 
Uh, once you get this thing wet with oil, it's going to start to swell. So you've got to be on the move when you do that. I got all the liners final installed in that the other night before I had to quit on it. So I'm ready to move on to rods and pistons now. Got my rods back from the machine shop here. They've been checked out. New bushings in the upper end. Uh, they're all good to go. First thing I do is weigh all my rods, pistons, and piston pins. So uh, here's one of the pistons. That one weighs 4,235 grams. Typically the piston pins will all be the same. You might have one that's off by 5 grams maybe. But uh, So that's what I do first. I do all six of each. And then I'll match those together in a combination. So that they're all as close to each other as they can be. And then I'll also look at companion cylinders. And where each one is at. Uh, in relation to each other. Um, I've had some people comment in the past on this. And tell me that this is not how you balance an engine. I'm well aware of that. This is a heavy duty diesel engine. Uh, this is not something that's called for in the manual. This is not something that 98% of guys who put these engines together even do. This is just something I do to get everything that much closer than it normally would be. I'm well aware that this is not how NASCAR balances their engines. Let me get everything weighed up here and lined out and I'll show you the assembly of one of these rods and pistons, and then I'll show you one of them actually going into the engine. This engine's getting a C15A cert crank, so I've been over this before, but the A cert crankshaft. It's got a larger rod journal than the 14.6 crankshaft. The ACERT rods are also a 4 bolt rod where the 14.6 rod is a 2 bolt rod. And the ACERT rods have this oil hole in them that goes through from the upper pin bore through the rod to the lower bore. The 14.6 rods do not have that oil hole either. Alright, I'll show you how one of these rods and pistons goes together. So there's really nothing to it. You've got two clips, one on each side of the piston. This one's already assembled. You can see the clip in there. So the rod goes up inside of the piston. The pin goes through. And then there's a clip on each side to hold the pin inside of the piston. Already got the oil control ring on. This is the second ring. These IPD rings are marked with up. And numbered so you really can't screw it up. top ring I was able to get all six rod piston assemblies within 20 grams of each other and then also all three sets of companion cylinders are within 20 grams of each other. So for an engine this size, that's really good. Let me get set up over here and I'll show you how this goes in. If you ask me, this is the only style of ring compressor to use for building these engines. Uh, the only thing with these is you got to make sure you don't have a ring gap in either one of the two places where it comes together. Other than that, it works great. 
you can pick the whole rod piston assembly up and carry it around just using that ring compressor. Uh, works real good. You'll see how that works here in just a second. But Got the upper part of the cylinder all coated with oil. I install pistons with the uh, rod journal up at top dead center. There's a lot of guys that do it the other way around. Uh, I've tried it every which way. This is by far the way that works the best for me. The problem with these engines and these, especially with these one-piece steel pistons is if you put the rod journal at bottom dead center, as soon as that rod piston gets fully into that cylinder, you don't have any control over it anymore and it'll slam straight to the bottom. Well, my other camera went into full retard mode and there was no bringing it back, so I'm gonna have to finish this out with this GoPro, which is an equally big piece of shit. but anyway, uh, yes, I did stagger my ring gaps. You didn't see that on camera, but yes, I did it. I'm ready to start torquing rod bolts now. There's the bottom of the four bolt Acert rod. Same rod that's used in a C18 too. Uh, this is also the time to put the piston cooling jets in, so I've got them cleaned up here and ready to go. Those go to 52 plus or minus 3 in that order, and then you come back and you go 60 more degrees plus or minus 5 degrees. One dot for the torque, one dot for the angle. It's ready for a cylinder head. Just got to throw the spacer plate on there and get a couple things tweaked up and uh, be ready to set the head on it. Good. This is a brand new head, brand new casting, brand new valves, springs, guides, seats, rotocoils, everything. I'm using some more of these IPD cryo treated head bolts. I had quite a few people asking me about these after that last video, uh, the last engine build video that I did, so. They are uh, supposedly the highest grade steel forged bolt in the uh, ISO system or whatever they call it. It's like an ISO 
And the whole deal with the cryogenic process, what it does, I mean, the main benefit is that it reduces the rate that the bolts fatigue due to thermal cycling, so the warming and cooling that engines always do. And it makes these bolts retain their tightness a lot better than a non-cryo-treated bolt will. And it supposedly also um, optimizes tensile strength and stuff like that. So these are pretty reasonable priced. I think they're a pretty good deal. I'll be using them in all the engines I put together. Little voice over here. I don't know if anybody's going to watch this garbage or not, but I did not intend for this to be a how-to video. There's a whole lot more that can be shown and said than what you saw here. I just wanted to uh, show some of the major components of one of these engines going together in a little bit more detail than what I've shown before. So we'll probably do about 700 horsepower with this engine and a couple thousand foot-pounds of torque, maybe just a little bit more than that. Nothing real wild, just something to go out there and live a long and profitable life. Guess that's all I've got. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.